Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Good morning everyone. I'm Cindy Maka, Director of the Western Museum of Flight. Thank you all for coming. Today we are privileged to receive an eyewitness account of a significant event in American military and political history. The event was shamefully kept under wraps for a very long time. It is a story that is important for all Americans to be aware of so that we can understand the degree of harm and suffering that can be caused by political expediency at very high levels in government. It's a compelling story. In the highest tradition of a U.S. Navy sailor refusing to leave his shipmates behind, Don Pogler distinguished himself by remaining with the ship until he was satisfied that he had rescued all of those he could reach. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great respect, Don Pogler. Thank you. Um, as I emailed a lot of my friends and uh, sent them Cindy's thing, I s said I think I'm overbilled, but uh, <laughs> uh, I ended up doing uh, three years in post-traumatic stress disorder therapy in the late 80s, and much of that was trying to deal with survivor's guilt. I had asked Gerald to put this slide up before I start the slideshow because, and if I hope I can keep myself together through this. Thing. This photo was taken in Rochester, New York at Ontario Beach State Park. It's a stone that was put up for our ship uh, by the VVA, Vietnam Veterans of America, and the VFW. The reason I wanted Gerald to put it up there is I lost my wife uh, seven months ago uh, unexpectedly to heart failure. And so this picture was taken of her and I at this stone. I can't even recite it verbatim, but the one thing that they put on the stone that had never been said before was that we were the most decorated ship in U.S. Navy history for one single action, that, that you wouldn't compare us to a World War II ship who had been through multiple battles. But uh, And at the bottom of the stone is a quote that Admiral Martin, who was uh, Fleet Admiral of the Sixth Fleet at the time, made. We were a um, converted World War II cargo ship, a Victory class ship. As a matter of fact, we were the same hull as the SS Lane Victory down here in San Pedro. So if you go on board, the only the Navy had taken two of these Victory class ships <clears throat> out of the Merchant Mothball fleet and converted them into intelligence ships. Um, although the uh, World War II ships had better armament than we did. All we had was 450 caliber machine guns. Uh, the World War II ships had a three inch gun on the aft end of the ship. We were known in World War II as a cargo ship as the SS Simons. Um, a little bit about the attack that we'll get into later, but uh, I'll give you kind of a quick overview. When the Israeli fighters came out and left us. We had over 820 rocket and cannon holes in the top side of the ship, not to mention over 3,000 machine gun hits. Then they came out with Mystere bombers and dropped napalm on us. And while we were trying to fight the fires from the napalm, they brought out three Navy torpedo boats, fired five torpedoes at us, and we took one 40-foot torpedo hole in the starboard side. When all was said and done, there were 34 dead and 174 wounded, which represented 70% of the crew. Uh, our crew complement was 294 men. A tour of duty on the Liberty for a, a crypto technician like me was 18 months. We would go to the west coast of Africa for four months, then come back to Norfolk and be in port for two months, and, we'd, and you'd make three cruises. Our normal run was up and down the west coast of Africa. We left uh, Norfolk on May 2nd. Uh, late that month, we pulled into Abidjan. We were supposed to have four and a half days liberty. And uh, after a day and a half, uh, one of the officers was driving around town in the ship's truck saying, everybody's got to come back to the ship. So uh, we rounded everybody up, and we had gotten orders from the Joint Chiefs of Staff directly to go to Rota, Spain. Uh, at that time, they didn't say where we were going. They said we would receive further orders uh, after we left Rota. 
so uh, we did, and we went to Rota. So the top pictures are in the Atlantic on the way down. Uh, the skinny kid on the right's me. Um, down below is the Hotel of Va, which was owned by Pan Am at the time in Abidjan. We went to Rota to pick up supplies and personnel, and um, we picked up a Russian linguist who happened to be a Marine Corps sergeant. And uh, in Rota, he had been flying EC-120 missions, 121 missions. Uh, he was a Russian linguist, and um, he said he he told me he says you know he says I was supposed to go back to Bremerhaven, Germany, and he said in the middle of the night I got a knock on the door and this sailor was standing at the door and he said you've got orders to report to the Liberty. And uh, he said, here's your orders, they're from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And Bryce looked at the sailor and said, since when does the Joint Chiefs of Staff give a Marine Corps sergeant orders? This was when we were in Rota. Um, there is uh, one picture the Navy wouldn't be particularly happy that I had taken. Uh, it's the one, bottom one on the right. If you notice, there's a subtender there, and there happens to be a nuclear fast attack submarine sitting down in front of it. It's behind me. Actually, I did not, it was my camera. I didn't take the photo because I'm in the, fo in the photo. Uh, so anyway, we got orders to go uh, into the Mediterranean, and we were supposed to be 12 to 15 miles off the coast. Uh, we were sitting, uh, right off the border of Egypt and Israel, uh, off of uh, El Arish. And um, when we got there, the seventh and the eighth, we were traveling at five knots. All we had for armament was 450 caliber machine guns. The Israelis, when they came later, said that they um, came out to find the ship that was shelling the shore. Well. You can't shell the shore with a 50 caliber machine gun 12 miles offshore. And uh, then uh, they also said, uh, which there is a comparison photo up here, that they mistook us for an Egyptian tramper called the El Khazir, which I found out later even the Mossad knew at the time that it was in Alexandria, Egypt and wasn't seaworthy, it was in dry dock. And, uh, but, uh, to mistake us for it was kind of unbelievable. It was one quarter of the displacement of the Liberty. And um, they also said that they thought on the way out that they had us, the torpedo boat said they thought they had us on radar at 30 knots. Well, <laughs> the uh, the lane victory, the, the top speed of, a, um, of our ship was uh, 18 knots. And the El Khazir's uh, top speed was 12 knots. My understanding of it was that it was built by the British and was a World War I uh, horse carrier. And um, so uh, there were no ships around that were going to be doing 30 knots. Oh, and, and in addition, uh, they, uh, they claimed they didn't see the flag when they came out. All my my uh, shipmates that were topside said that we were flying the flag. Uh, in the middle of the attack, the flag got so tattered that we took down our steaming colors, which is a five by eight foot flag, and put up our holiday colors, which is a seven by 13 foot flag, which is an extremely large flag. This photo is taken obviously before the attack. The man on the bottom left and the man on the left of the photo on the right is our executive officer Armstrong and he was killed during the attack. The man to his right was one of my crypto chiefs, he, he, Chief Smith, and uh, he was also killed. There is a barracks named after him in Pensacola, Florida at the school where I was trained. These were three of our top officers who were sunbathing a couple hours before we were attacked. Uh, Armstrong, uh, Lieutenant Golden, who was our engineering officer who also happened to have had uh, two ships shot out from under him during World War II, and on the right was Captain McGonagall. So um, the top left photo, the Israelis had run nine to 13 reconnaissance missions on us in the morning. They even admit that they had us identified as an American intelligence ship at six o'clock in the morning. 
But then they uh, later say that the, um, somebody took the marker off the board in Haifa during the shift change at 8 o'clock, and so that it wasn't there. The photo on the right is uh, the first attack Mirage fighter coming in at us um, during the attack. Uh, down below, uh, our, the one on the right is me with two of the 820 rocket holes. Uh, top left is Captain McGonigal on the bridge with a rocket hole, uh, Ensign Lucas with a couple of rocket holes. Uh, that's a similar picture to the one of me. He's a friend of mine, Herb Peetham. He lives in Missouri now. So uh, just more pictures of the rocket holes. And uh, mistaking us for a warship, like I said, all we had was 450 caliber machine guns. We had our, we were loaded with antennas. The top left antenna, which looks like a ground station dish, is um, what we call Trescom. Uh, this was 67. The first satellites were put up in 62. They didn't carry much traffic. They were small. Matter of fact, I retired from Hughes, and uh, the first satellite Hughes put up was about the size of a footstool. So uh, we used this antenna. It was a brainchild of some lieutenant back in D.C. We used this antenna to bounce our signal off the moon and use the moon as a satellite back to Sheltonham, Maryland, to NSA headquarters. As Admiral Moore, who was twice chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff in the 70s, said, he didn't see how anybody could mistake us for anything but what we were. He said the Liberty was the ugliest ship in the United States Navy. It looked like an overgrown lobster. So these pictures were taken looking from aft looking forward, and so that is the starboard side of the bridge on the left where you can see three rocket holes. Uh, down below it is where our whale boat hung, where, uh, or our ca captain's gig, and uh, it burnt from fire. The photo on the left is probably the best photo as far as showing, you know, the damage, uh, you know, the extent of all the damage. Uh, that photo actually ended up, I think it was July edition of Life magazine. But it really doesn't tell the story of the Liberty. It doesn't, the, the whole Life magazine was mainly a spread about what the Israelis were doing with the Six Day War. And it really doesn't say hardly anything about the Liberty. And the other photos just show more, more rocket damage. So this is uh, the top left is the, looking at the bridge. Um, the uh, top right are more rocket holes in the bridge. Um, down below the one on the left, if you look at the right side of it, you see a round cylindrical thing. That's one of our mini antennas. Turns out that the Israelis were jamming all our frequencies that we were using. So uh, we were lucky. The only way, the only reason we happened to get a distress call out was um, that one of our antennas hadn't been working and didn't even have a wire strung to it. And so uh, one of our uh, ETs uh, got a line and, and went out on the deck and strung a line to it. And so I guess they didn't, weren't jamming that frequency because we hadn't been using it. And um, it turns out that uh, both our presidential unit citation and Captain McGonigal's Medal of Honor are up here. And if you read them, it says we were attacked by foreign jet aircraft and torpedo boats. It never says that it was the Israelis that attacked us. Terry Halbardier, who lives up in Visalia, was the one who strung the long line. And so about three, four years ago, he was given the Silver Star. I went up for the presentation. It turns out his Silver Star citation is the first document that actually names the Israelis as the people who attacked us. This. Um, on the left, well, actually, both of these is our forward starboard gun mount, our 50 caliber gun mount. Uh, Alexander Thompson, our gunner's mate, was in that gun mount at the time, and Ennis, Lieutenant Ennis, who wrote the f first book, Assault on the Liberty, says he saw a rocket hit Thompson, and he flew in the air like a right doll end over end. And uh, you can see going down the bulkhead of the forecastle, uh, the blood of Thompson, that's what's left of him. The photo on the right, I am now up on the forecastle looking into the gun mount. The interesting thing about that photo is 
that this is the following day. We didn't see any Americans till the following day. This is the following day in the USS Davis, the destroyers alongside of us, sailing alongside of us. And you can see in the background their anti-aircraft gun and how much larger it is than our little 50 caliber pea shooter. These are uh, cabin photos. Uh, the one on the bottom left, obviously, is Captain McGonigal sitting in his cabin. There's a rocket hole right underneath the porthole. The one on the right is a picture taken looking out of the rocket hole in Lieutenant Golden's cabin. You can't really see it very well, but the top left photo, that's our main mast. It actually had a rocket hole in it, too. Um, the uh, gun mount is the port uh, forward gun mount. The two bottom ones, again, are the, an the antennas. Um, and you can see they knew exactly what they were going after. Uh, it, it, all our antennas had lots of, lots of holes in them. This is more battle damage. The most interesting thing about these slides are that if you look at the bottom left, the metal is going out. The rocket went in the starboard side of the ship, passed clear through the ship, and came out this hatch on the port side. The, uh, let's see, the, so this, this I, I've already spoke to uh, about the, the damage and uh, the fighters. Uh, you'll notice that it says 171 wounded. Since the time I did this slideshow, 15 or years or so ago, we now have had three other guys receive Purple Hearts, so that number has grown from 171 to 174. So after the fighters, as I said, they came out with Mystere bombers and dropped napalm on us. This all shows fire damage. The four photos on the left are uh, sequential photos. If you look at the bottom left, that is a life raft rack uh, that we had, uh, inflatable life rafts, they all burnt. The photo to the right of it is where that rack attaches to the bulkhead. And then uh, the photo above it is also where it attaches. I'm looking up and above it is the uh, midship gun mount. And then the one on the left and the top is I went up above and took a picture looking into the midship gun mount. And so the top left shows uh, kind of where the fire line stopped there. Uh, again, the bottom has uh, an antenna, and the one on the right shows the Trescom dish antenna. On the top is uh, Captain McGonigal and Lieutenant Painter. Lieutenant Painter was one of my crypto officers. McGonigal looks like he's missing a leg, and he's not. It's, uh, the photo's just dark. However, he did have extreme shrapnel damage in the leg. They had cut off his pant leg and used his belt and put a tourniquet on his leg. So that's why he looks the way he does there. We had set up all the hospital area down on the mess decks, and that was my uh, general quarters station. So that's why you see all the wounded. They're laying on, on our tables in the mess decks. Uh, one of the interesting stories about McGonigal, he, re he grew up in uh, Coachella Valley, um, east of Palm Springs and gra graduated from Coachella Valley High School. And when he retired, he retired in Palm Springs. And um, he, it was uh, sometime in the 90s, I think early 90s, and he told me, he said, I looked down in the bathtub, I was taking a shower, and he said there was blood in the bottom of the bathtub, so I asked my wife to come in and take a look at the back of him, and he had had a piece of shrapnel in his back that had been lodged there for almost 20 years, 20, you know, 15 to 20 years, that had finally worked its way out, and that's, that's what, why he had the blood in, the, in there. Um, my, we got hit at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. My, the crypto technicians, the intelligence group, we worked uh, three shifts, eight-hour shifts. And I had just worked the mid-watch from midnight to 8 in the morning, and I'd come off my mid-watch and um, at 8 and got eaten some breakfast in our sleeping compartment. The deck crew slept in the forward part of the ship, and the crypto guys slept in the aft part of the ship because all our stuff was so classified, even though we weren't supposed to talk about it outside the working spaces. Uh, they, they wanted to separate it in case people did say something, it wouldn't be overheard. And so I, I got through eating breakfast and I 
crawled in the rack and uh, and was sleeping and uh, Captain McGonigal was a real stickler for general quarters drills. So at one o'clock I was rudely awakened by his general quarters drill and my general quarters station happened to be on the mess decks which was right forward to where I was sleeping on repair party three. And so um, I got dressed and w went to my duty, my general quarters station and uh, we secured from the drill around um, 135, 140. And so since I was off duty, uh, those of us that were, a lot of us that were off duty, we went up to the fantail and were smoking cigarettes and just relaxing. And I had just decided to go back down into my sleeping quarters. And I was halfway down the ladder when I heard all the metal hitting topside from the ro rocket and machine gun fire. So I just proceeded down into my sleeping quarters and uh, onto the mess decks. Well, my I was so green, this was my, I had just gotten out of crypto school in Pensacola and I got on board the Liberty late March. Uh, we went to sea May the 2nd and we were attacked June the 8th. So I was about as green as anybody on the boat. And we, uh, um, so they, they had me be in charge of a submergible pump. Well, during an air attack, obviously there's no need for a submergible pump. So somebody grabbed me and said, go to the bridge and bring wounded down. So I and another guy ran up the ladders through the superstructure, the inside part of the ship, which was the safest way to get up there. And, uh, and just as we got up there, somebody opened the hatch and said, here, take this guy below. They had a guy on a stretcher, and so we did. And uh, I don't remember how many runs I made up and down the ladders with wounded. Um, and I guess I may as well throw this in now. I felt terribly guilty for years that I had a Purple Heart. As a matter of fact, I put my Purple Heart in a drawer for 20 years, never wanted anybody to know that I had it because my wounds consisted of uh, cuts and burns and bruises, uh, most of which came from bouncing off the ladders trying to carry the wounded down from, from the bridge. So this is more uh, of what was taking place on the mess decks. And um, I think uh, the, the, the guy on the bottom left now lives in Hawaii. Uh, he's been pretty much in and out of VA hospitals all his life. So after the air attack and they came out with the torpedo boats, and uh, I, one, one thing I remember was on the mess deck, somebody said, uh, Captain McGonigal had come on the PA system, say, uh, prepare for a torpedo attack. And so somebody said, throw yourself across the wounded. So uh, we all did as much as we could. It turned out that that was a smart thing for somebody to recommend because when the torpedo hit, uh, it was like a giant was on one side of the ship and just lifted it up and then we slowly sank it back down in the water. And if we hadn't have done that, all those guys would have just rolled off the tables onto the floor. They had fired five torpedoes at us and luckily we only took one. I mean, if, if most people say a ship like that shouldn't even taken one and it should have gone to the bottom. If we'd have taken more than one, I know we'd have gone to the bottom. But so 25, uh, 25 of the 34 died then died where the torpedo hit, which was where I worked in the intelligence spaces. And so after, after we took the torpedo attack, um, I guess one of the things I remember was uh, Doc Kiefer, we had uh, one doctor and two corpsmen for uh, over 200 wounded and dead. And um, Doc Kiefer uh, grabbed me and said, lay down here on this table next to this other guy. And uh, they stuck a needle in me and ran a tube across a stanchion and he was gonna operate on this guy. Um, and uh, the only thing, I guess they were trying to do a live blood transfusion and the only thing I, I remember was Kiefer opened the guy up and said his kidneys are all shot out. He said there's nothing I can do for him and he sewed him up and went to the next, next person. This is one of the three torpedo boats that, that came uh, out and um, 
as you can tell by my description, I spent most of my, all my time down below, but many of the guys that were topside said that after the torpedo, but after we took the torpedo and the torpedo boats kind of just milled around, uh, we threw our last two inflatable life rafts in the water and the torpedo boats came over and machine gun holes in the life rafts. People ask me, how did you keep that ship afloat? First of all, I was so green, I couldn't tell you anyway. Second of all, I'm not sure any of us know, outside of the fact that God wanted us to stay afloat, I guess. But uh, one of the things we use, and I, under, I understand from talking to a kid that had just returned from boot camp uh, probably five years ago when my wife and I were in Albuquerque, that they now ch use the liberty to teach damage control in boot camp. What we did was called K-shoring. And this is one of the internal bulkheads next to where the torpedo uh, hole was. And so to keep the bulkhead from collapsing from all the sea pressure, we used timber to uh, do what this what was called k-shoring and, and shore up uh, the bulkheads around the, the that that area. As I said, the attack started at 2 p.m. At 2:05, we got a distress call out. Um, captain Tully was captain of the Saratoga, one of the two carriers. He was an old World War II pilot, and he, he sort of jumped the gun and. Uh, he told me he, he and Ruth had retired and lived in Carmel. They're both dead now, but uh, and even I, my wife and I used to go up and take them out to dinner once a year. And poor Joe would sit in his living room and look at me and say, I never could understand why my planes were recalled. Well, he told me that within 15 to 20 minutes, he had six, uh, 16 planes, uh, four tankers and 12 fighter bombers in the air to come to our aid. He said, but before they were out of sight, they were recalled. We took the torpedo hit between 235 and 240, so there's a good chance that those planes could have gotten to us before we took the torpedo attack. So there's a possibility that they may have saved 25 guys' lives had they not been recalled. We didn't see any Americans till the next day, and this was the following morning when the USS Davis and the USS Massey came alongside, and I just took sequential pictures as they came closer and closer. And, of course, shelling the shore, that's the USS Davis on the left, and we were doing a high line transfer. If we'd have had a five-inch gun like that, we could have shelled the shore maybe, but uh, not with our 50 caliber machine guns. The photo on the right, the Davis, again, is uh, sailing alongside of us. These are pictures of guys on the America taking pictures of us. In the afternoon, the America finally came alongside and since they had hospital capabilities, they, they were a carrier. Uh, these, these are pictures of uh, us evacuating uh, our really badly wounded with helicopters from our folks all over to the America. And this is them unloading some of uh, the wounded. Dave told me a few years ago that when they had him on the stretcher, they had him covered up with a blanket. And the crew chief on the helicopter sat down at the end of the stretcher, and I guess he probably thought he was sitting at the foot end, and it turns out he sat on Dave's head. And Dave said to me, what an ignominious way to die, he said, being suffocated by one of my own men. So on the left is my boss. He was a lieutenant commander at the time, Dave Lewis. He was 10 feet from the torpedo when it went off. Managed to survive, but uh, because of all the pain on the bulkheads and everything, uh, and the torpedo blast, it flash burned him all over his body. So when they got him over to the America, the doctors had to lance his eyes open because they were seared shut, and then they cleaned him up and they said, Admiral Geis wants to see you in his cabin. So Dave went up there and, and Geis um, said, I want the senior officer, officer off the liberty to know this story, but I don't want you to ever repeat it until I'm dead or gone because he said, I've got a naval career to protect. So Dave did. In 1997, I got the Navy Memorial in DC to put on a month-long display about what happened to us. 
And I wrote it, the guys off the ship, and I said, here's your chance to tell your story. If you want to send me something I can use in the display. And Dave wrote me this letter, which is on the bottom of one of these sheets up here. And I'll tell it the way he told it to me rather than what's in the letter. He cleaned it up a little bit. He said, um, Geis looked at him and said, when Tully put up his planes, I radioed Washington, and he said, the next thing I knew, Secretary of Defense McNamara came on and said, recall the planes. And he said, I could, he looked at Dave and said, I couldn't believe they were going to abandon you guys, so the only thing I could think of is they thought maybe there were nuclear weapons on those planes. So he said, I told both the America and the Saratoga to bring up older planes from below that could only carry conventional armament. 90 minutes, an hour and a half after the attack started, put up a set of planes from each carrier, radioed Washington, McNamara came on and said, recall the planes again. He looked at Dave and said, I still couldn't believe they were going to abandon you guys, so I decided to push it. He said, I asked him to authenticate his message. Well, in the Navy, that means, does your boss agree with the orders you're giving me? And uh, he said, the next thing I knew, Lyndon Johnson came on and said, recall the damn planes. I don't care who dies. I'm not going to embarrass my allies. So the White House left us for dead. These are many of the, my other shipmates that had been evacuated, and they're getting ready uh, for a memorial service on the America Force. Uh, I wasn't there because I stayed with the ship, but um, they exercised their Marines on board. So after we took the torpedo attack and the, uh, Davis and the Massey and the America came alongside, uh, we sailed the ship a thousand miles across the Mediterranean and put her in dry dock in Malta. It took us a week because we could only do five knots. They were afraid the ship would shake apart because if you, we went any faster than that. Uh, two of the things I remember on the way was um, where you saw that K showing, showing it had been cleaned up. Uh, that night uh, after the attack, they took me up there and said, watch, sit here and watch the, this case shoring, make sure it doesn't give way. And it, the whole uh, passageway was full of fuel oil and everything. And I had a little one battery flashlight that didn't put out much light. And then uh, a couple of days later on the way to Malta, they took me down in the bottom part of the ship where we call shaft alley, where the uh, drive shaft ran from the engine room back to the screw, and said, uh, we want you to watch the drive shaft, make sure it doesn't start leaking and vibrate too much, and if it does, call the bridge and tell them we're going to have to abandon ship, and I thought, that's great, you guys might get off of here, but I'm stuck clear down here in the bottom of the ship. Uh, I think uh, the one slide, I, I did this a lot of years ago, may have, have a little bit of a mistake in it. I think I said something about a 15 degree list. And after talking to guys over the years, my understanding is that while on the way to Malta, we actually had a nine degree list. We ended up going to a maximum of a 15 degree list after the torpedo hack hit. But then we, when we settled out, we were like a nine degree list. So you can kind of see how we are listing to one side. So this is when, when we got to Malta. Um, you can see the tip of the torpedo hull. There's other slides here that have that. Again, that's the bridge, and that's the uh, tip of the torpedo hull. Uh, so then for security reasons, since it was where I worked, they initially covered it with this tarp when we got into the dry dock area. There's a story that I'll tell you, but it's unsubstantiated, so I'm not really saying it's true. And that is, uh, supposedly Doc Kiefer said that one of these three divers told him years later that when they went in the torpedo hole, uh, there was a second torpedo in there that was a dud that hadn't gone off. But I can't swear to the, the, the validity of that story. So you can see the timber holding the ship up. The interesting thing uh, the photo on the right, you can see the tip of the hole and then the water line. All that below is all torpedo hole. And if you see that line that I drew with my computer going down, it goes down to a, a person with a white hat on. 
That's one of my shipmates standing there to give you a perspective of how big the hole was. It was a 40-foot hole. So these are uh, more pictures inside where the torpedo hit, where, where I worked. On the way to Malta, the USS Papago came out and met us halfway and followed us to Malta. It was a seagoing tug. And it turns out uh, I just had dinner the night before last with uh, one of my shipmates who lives in San Diego but works up in this area. And he uh, was a yeoman at the time on the ship, but he got out and went back in the Navy and became a deep sea diver. He ended up being stationed years later on the Papago. And the Papago, uh, we lost some bodies out the torpedo hole on the way to Malta, and so they always carry divers. So uh, part of their job was to retrieve our, uh, our, our dead. And then um, also <laughs> they did some work for the NSA. If, if, if paperwork and stuff from our, our intelligence base is washed out, they would run their screw forward and backward to try and chew up as much of the classified material as they could. This is inside the cleanup. Uh, some people say the guy on the left in the, is me in the coveralls, but um, I'm not so sure whether it was or it wasn't. That, that, that was what I was wearing. I spent two days when we got there, they wanted those of us with the top secret crypto clearances to go down and clean up first since it was where we worked. And uh, I only remember 15 minutes of those two days. Um, in the first 15 minutes, I found an arm. And I knew whose arm it was because he had been a bodybuilder. And um, after that, I, even after three years of post-traumatic stress disorder therapy, I, I still only remember those first 15 minutes. Turns out that about a year, a little over a year ago, last well, a year ago, last fall, I found out that Phil was buried just south of Modesto. So when Eva and I went up to my sister's in Los Altos last February, we went over to visit his grave. These are more photos inside. On the left are some of my shipmates to clean up. On the right is me. Uh, if you can tell, I wasn't a happy camper. After the two days down there cleaning up, I went on Liberty, and as I told somebody, the only thing I remember was one night around 6 o'clock I was in a bar drinking cognac out of 8-ounce tumblers, and I have no idea how I got back to the ship. So this is uh, loading caskets onto the ship and some of the body bags. Since they were going to patch the ship up, and two-thirds at least of the crew were crypto technicians, and they weren't going to need us because we weren't going to be doing our job anymore, many of us were flown back to, to Norfolk. Uh, so they only kept a skeleton crew. Some of them were crypto technicians, but they only kept a, 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 as few as they needed to sail the ship back after they repaired her. So I was one of the ones flown back. They eventually, in 68, scrapped the, the Liberty, sold her for scrap. So these were pictures taken of her on the way back. Besides the fact the Israelis say they didn't see the flag, and you can see we're f flying our steaming colors, a five by eight foot flag on the right there. One of the findings of the Court of Inquiry, which took place in Malta, was that the flag must have hung limp at the mast. Well, Lieutenant Ennis said that there are logbooks that show that there were 12 knots of wind blowing that day, and he said only eight knots are necessary to make a flag fly. So uh, that doesn't wash either. One thing that people ask me about um, that I usually don't mention is you can see on the forward part of the ship, the, it, our ship said GTR-5. Uh, our actual designation was AGTR-5. We were an auxiliary ship. It's called uh, technical research. And on the aft end of the ship was uh, the name of our ship, USS Liberty. So instead of bringing her back into Norfolk, they brought her into Little Creek. And this is her docking in Little Creek. Little Creek is a small base right south, just a few miles south of Norfolk. And if you can, these are 34 guys to remember because they gave their life for our country.
and I was told, you've got the highest security clearance anybody can get in this country. Go away, never talk about this to anybody, including your family. So for 20 years, I kept my mouth shut. And in 1985, I started losing my vision and ended up in an optometrist office across the street from the Westminster Mall. And he said, you don't have an eye problem, buddy. You have a physical problem. You better see a doctor. So he referred me to a doctor. And the doctor, who's still my doctor, came back in, white as a sheet, and looked at me and said, um, I don't know why you're still alive. You should have died a long time ago. He said, uh, your blood pressure is 240 over 145. He said, it's been that way for a long time to do the damage to the eyes. And he, he, so it turns out that luckily I was having strokes in the retina of my eyes instead of my heart or my brain where it would have killed me. And that's then, that was almost the end of the year 85. In April of 87, I started at the vet center. In that year and a half, he could only, he put me on as heavy medication as he could. And in a year and a half, he could only get it down to 140 to 180 over to 100 to 140. And, um, um, so I finally found out <laughs> for, there's a few guys that are old enough to remember this. Um, I was watching a Simon and Simon detective show and the, uh, one brother had been in Vietnam and was battling PTSD. So when I, I looked at that and I said, geez, that's me. So I called, um, the VA hospital in Long Beach, and they said, well, we don't do that here, but the closest vet center to you is five blocks north of Disneyland. And within a month of going to the vet center and being able to talk about what happened to us, both blood pressure numbers dropped 30 points, no change in medication. So I'll give you an idea what stress can do to your body. But um, uh, I was lucky. I went back to the University of Kansas and got a degree in business and ended up at uh, Caterpillar Tractor Company for three years in their corporate offices in Peoria. And then I came out here thinking if I could go to the beach every weekend, I'd be a happy guy. And as long as I was dragging around what was inside of me, I wasn't going to be happy no matter where I was. Uh, but I was lucky. I worked for uh, five years at Hughes Helicopters in Culver City and then 20 years and retired from Hughes Aircraft in El Segundo. He wants to know if I can speak to what the Liberty's mission was. Uh, and uh, the reason they told me what they told me when they debriefed me was because when I went into the Naval Security Group, I signed a piece of paper that said uh, 10 years in prison and $10,000 fine if you ever talk about what you do for a job. So that's part of the answer. The other part of the answer is, uh, I have all kinds of th things I can beg out on, on this one, is as I said, uh, I was so green, I had gotten on board, I, I was, uh, we had, I'd gotten on board the end of March, we went to see May the 2nd, shot up June the 8th, and three weeks later I was back in Kansas going, what happened to me? And so I was so green that uh, I was basically, not only was I, I uh, in a baptism by fire, uh, combat-wise, but I was basically trying to learn what was going on being a crypto technician. I mean, I really wasn't. Now, I, I, can, I can say that uh, many, uh, so, so whether it's these things that I, that I related that other people have said are the reasons, uh, you know, and all I know is that I've heard Dave Lewis say before that we didn't have any Hebrew linguists on board. I do know that we had a lot of, um, of Russian linguists on board, probably some Arabic ones. Uh, they do, the, um, um, and, I, and I don't know who it was that said it, but a lot of, a lot of people have said we were there to find out how much the Russians were involved with the Egyptians. I mean, were they just supplying them with planes or did they actually have Russian pilots flying, flying the planes? You know, whatever. So those are the things I can, but no, from an official standpoint, no, I can't say anything more than that. Admiral Kidd was in charge of the Court of Inquiry in Malta. Captain Boston was the legal counsel. He would have been like the district attorney uh, he, his job was to bring the facts before the court. 
two two things that Boston told me was that that one was that his papers were altered when they got back to Washington. That what was released by our government was not exactly what he had sent back. Secondly, that he said that he and Kidd flew on board a few days after we were attacked and that he said that Kidd looked at him and said, it's obvious that they wanted to kill everybody, sink the ship and kill everybody on board. Now, I'm not going to put words in their mouth as to why. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, why do you think they would do this, you know? And uh, only the Israelis can ever share with the world what their real motives were. I can say there's nobody on the ship that's going to accept case of mistaken identity as a valid, a, a valid thing. Um, but um, I can share with you uh, Admiral Moore, who was twice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he always said that our government had told the Israelis that we would support them as long as what they did was defensive in nature. And the day after they tried to sink us was when they attacked Syria and took the Golan Heights which obviously is not defensive. So that was always Moore's supposition. Now I have a, uh, to go along with that, none of this, you know, that I can sw say, put words in their mouth exactly, but uh, on, uh, there is a sheet up here that has a declassified CIA document on it that speaks to Moshe Dayan knowing who we were when he ordered the attack. But if you turn it over on the back side is an account of my wife and I in 2004 were coming back from my mother's house in Kansas. And uh, we stayed in the Best Western in Taos, New Mexico. And when uh, I was walking down the hall with one of my, matter of fact, the shirt that George has on, and uh, my wife looked at the guy and said, are you interested in that shirt? And I turned around and he had a sheepish look on his face and he said, I got to tell you, uh, I'm a, I was an officer in the Israeli army in 1967 when you were attacked. And I was so impressed he had guts enough to say anything to my face for all he knew, I might just tear his throat out. And so I, we invited him and his wife to go to the bar and I always carry a hard copy and a notebook of this slideshow. So I went to the car and, and got the notebook and went to the bar and w went through it with him. And when I got through, he looked at me and he said, I never could understand why the American government spent so much time covering this up. He said, because when the Six Day War was over, Moshe B Diane briefed all the officer cadre as an outtake to the war. And when he came to the Liberty, he didn't make any buns about it. He said, we tried to take out the Liberty because we didn't want him to find out what our plans were. So those are, you know, the, I can share those stories with you, but again, until the fact is neither government, neither the U.S. government nor the Israeli government will never officially speak to this. One night in group, when I was going through PTSD, uh, everybody else in my group pretty much was a Marine in Vietnam, and one of the guys looked at me and he said, um, you guys got screwed as bad, if not worse, than anybody I ever knew in Vietnam. He says, you got every right to be as angry as you could be. And then he got right in my face and said, but it's your anger. What are you going to do with it? And I thought, I have to own this too. So um, it took me four and a half years. I wasn't going to write Congress. I knew they wouldn't do anything. Well, I finally decided I was. I needed to get rid of my blood, the blood pressure that was killing me and everything else. So I wrote a three-page letter with 30 pages of documentation to every California and Kansas congress, congressman and senator, and they all passed the buck back to Congressman Rohrbacher, and he asked me to come in and talk to him, and he looked across his desk and said, I've read everything you've written, all the material you sent me. He said, there's no way, I believe this was a mistake on the part of the Israelis, but he says, I gotta tell you, Congress won't touch this till after there's peace in the Middle East. Well, it won't be in my lifetime, so. Oh, he wanted to know what, what the aircraft, Israeli aircraft were. And my understanding is they were Mirage fighters and, and Mystere bombers. How long did the attack last? About as long as Pearl Harbor. Um, as I said, they, it started at 2 o'clock. Uh, we took the torpedo hit around 235, 240. Uh, the uh, uh, torpedo boats were still milling around and firing at the life rafts. So some people might say that the attack ended at 3.15, but it was almost between 4 and 4.30 when they actually 
said we made a mistake we, in, in, in between the, the torpedo boats, they did bring a helicopter out that had troops on it. So we figured they were going to try and board us, but uh, they didn't. That's another story I guess I didn't tell is that some of us were up at the uh, gun locker and trying to break into the gun locker and get small arms to fire at the helicopter. Fortunately, we couldn't because just giving them more ammunition to make it sound like we were aggressors. And, but uh, as I said about Thompson dying on the forward gunman, he had the keys to the gun locker, so we couldn't get in. So he, he wanted to know, did the attack cease? when we got the, our, de, our distress call out. No, it was a lot longer, later than that, but he, went, he says even if it was a case of mistaken identity, it's a war crime to, to try to keep uh, servicemen from saving their own lives, which is what, and, uh, yeah, uh, uh, shooting holes in the lifeboats would have been. Yeah. What about the airports in Italy? Were they not notified and why did they not respond? That I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know that. I do know uh, one of the stories, again, um, that is on one of the documentaries. Again, I, I, I think I might have mentioned there's a book list at the left-hand side of the table over there that you're welcome to take, and there's documentaries and books on it. And uh, supposedly, uh, we got our distress call out. And we had, they had already um, uh, destroyed all the authentication codes because they didn't want things to be captured. And so the, uh, our call sign was Rockstar and uh, the Saratoga's call sign was Schematic. And when, when uh, Schematic uh, answered our distress call, they asked for the authentication code, and our radio man couldn't give it to him. Finally, out of frustration, he held down his mic button and said, here's my damn authentication code, and let him listen to the bullets. <laughs> so was McNamara ever questioned under oath? And obviously not. But um, uh, the... Uh, there have been three documentaries done that are on that list over there. Uh, one of them was done by the BBC, this is, uh, called Dead in the Water. Dead in the Water uh, got to McNamara. And as far as I know, they're the only ones I ever saw that, that actually got to him and, and interviewed him. And when they asked him about the liberty, he just put his hands in the air and said, I don't know anything about the liberty. Now, personally, I, I go, how more stupid could you make yourself look? You're Secretary of Defense and you don't know anything about this intelligence ship that belongs to you. Yeah. He wants to know if, uh, about the fact that some of the crew were miffed because McGonagall never spoke up to this, which he did eventually. But I'll tell you that, like I said, going through PTSD and realizing that I suffered from survivor's guilt, I finally started thinking, geez, if I was a lowly seaman, and I'm having trouble with survivor's guilt, what must Captain McGonagall be feeling? So I went out and became friends, and so my wife and I, Eva, would go out every so often and have breakfast or lunch with him. And he told, told us a number of different, very interesting stories. Uh, he was born in Wichita, Kansas. He came from the same state I came from, and he, he, his dad was a migrant farm worker, and by late, early grade school, they had moved to Coachella Valley, and he said they used to, um, he used to load his uh, sister on the handlebars of his bicycle and take her to school and ride around town and pick up laundry and take him home for his mom to do laundry during the day. And then in the afternoon, he'd make the reverse trip. And then he said, uh, when I got, he was a very good football player. And when he got out of school, he said, I knew I couldn't go to college. We didn't have any money. He said, but I found out that the Navy, this was 44, he said, uh, I found out the Navy had a program where you, they would send you to college and then you'd obligate yourself for four years of service afterwards. So he got on this program and he was going to the University of Redlands and all of a sudden he's a sophomore in 46 and the war ends. And he went, oh, that's the end of my college career. He said, well, luckily the Navy ended up <coughs> letting all those guys on those programs find a school that had ROTC and finish up 
at a university that had ROTC, so he ended up graduating from USC. But Bill was an old time Navy man, and as long as he was in the Navy, he felt obligated to not rock the boat. So uh, I can't judge him for that personally, and I and I I, I know for a fact that that he ca he cared a lot. Uh, I've seen him not only with me, but when he would give talks, and I'll tell you what he said at our mass grave. Oh God, one of the most important things I didn't tell you too. But anyway, uh, Bill would grab his Medal of Honor and say, "I wear this for my whole crew because I was so inspired." that my men weren't giving up their need to save their ship, that that's why I stayed at my, the, uh, my post for 17 hours. Well, and that was like him trying to give us credit, and we were all running around scared, saying as long as the old man's still on the bridge, we may have a chance to survive this. So as I said in my interview I did with the National Purple Heart Hall of Honor in 2010, it really was a case of teamwork. That's the only way we survived the situation. Everybody did their job as best they could. But um, one of the other things besides his Medal of Honor being given um, in the Washington Naval Shipyard, um, of those 25 guys that I bagged up down where the torpedo hit that were all mostly body parts, six of them are buried in what we call our mass grave in Arlington. And we hold a service there every year on June 8th. And um, when they first put up the headstone, it read, died in the Eastern Mediterranean, like they died in some taxi cab accident in Beirut. It wasn't until people, it took almost 15 years before people raised enough hell to get it changed to kill USS Liberty. So, uh, and, and Bill, that's when Bill finally came out of his shell, was at our 97 reunion at, the, at our service. At, at our mass grave, and, and that's when he came out and said, I, for years, wanted to accept the fact that it was a case of mistaken identity, but he said, I have come to the conclusion that it wasn't, and that the Israeli government and the U.S. government owe the crew of the Liberty and the American people an answer to exactly what really took place. So. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.